Charlie and Lisa, thank you for sharing that great song. You guys did wonderful with that. If you have your Bible, I want you to look with me in Acts, the sixth chapter today. While you're turning there, I want to take the opportunity to tell you a couple of things. First, thank you for the very generous and wonderful gift you gave me last week for pastor appreciation. Uh, I appreciate your appreciation. That's a horrible way to say that, I guess, but you get the idea. Uh, you were very, very generous with the gift from the church, and, and I just am very thankful for that. And many of you have uh, sent cards and said things privately, and I just want you to know I love and appreciate you. I am thrilled to be your pastor. So God bless you, and thank you so very much. Now, I want you to be aware of something that is coming up starting this particular Wednesday night. For the next six Wednesday nights, beginning at 6.30 in the evening, going to 8 o'clock at night, we have the opportunity to be a part of an online Bible study with a friend of mine named Todd Brashley. Um, Todd is doing a series on where in the world is will. And what it's about is about finding God's will as opposed to our personal will. Now, that is an amazing topic, and I'm looking forward to being a part of that study. And I want you to be aware that if you come in person on Wednesday night, you need to be here at 6.30. This goes from 6.30 to 8, and it's going to happen. It's going to be a live event, but it, it, he's going to be teaching live, and we're going to be streaming that to the church. Now, he'll be sharing in other churches in the Eastern Time Zone as well. But um, this is not one of those Hulu-type things that you can miss it and pick it back up later. It, you've got to be either logging on to attend from your home. You can do that as well. Or you can come here on Wednesday nights. But again, you've got to come 30 minutes early. Not at 7, but at what time? 6.30. Thank you. You got that. Now, if you're going to be a part of it, if you want to watch it or you want to participate in, from the comfort of your home, you can do that. If you want to come and be a part of it with a, a group here in the sanctuary, you can do that as well. But we need you to register. And we have these little papers all up here on the altar so you can conveniently grab one after service. Or there are some in the foyer. And we just need your name and your email address. And you can drop it in that offering box. That offering box has multi-purposes, all right? You can put your offering in there, and you can also put these forms in there, and we will get some information to you about how to do this on your own if you would like. Uh, but we do need to register everybody, even if you're going to come and do this here in the sanctuary with us on Wednesdays at 630, or if you're going to do it at home. So please take note of that. Uh, we have been sharing on Sunday mornings about what it means to become a follower of Christ. And... We exist, we've acknowledged again and just reminded everybody that we as a congregation exist to make more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. My friends, it doesn't matter what we gain in this world if at the end of our lives we haven't followed Him and we don't know Him. We're going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Now we exist as a church to make more and better followers of Christ. What I want to see for you more than anything else is I want you to know Him. Now, I hope you get to know me. I've been with you for a little over a year and X number of months into this, I kind of had to back off on trying to get acquainted with folks because something called COVID-19 put us all at a distance, right? But I, I hope you, get to, you, you can get to know me and I can get to know you. But at the end of the day, and at the end of the messages I share, I don't care if you say Ray who, but I hope you know Jesus Christ. All right? Disciples of Jesus Christ, becoming a disciple begins with finding Him. You've got to enter into a relationship with Him. You've got to reach a point where you say, you know what, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and I'm lost in sin, and He's the only one who can save me. I've got to find Him. Now, He's not lost. I am, but I've still got to find Him. If we seek Him with our whole hearts, we will find Him, the Bible tells us. But not only do we need to find Him, we need to know Him. It's not enough to just know about Jesus. 
Jesus wants us to know Him. So becoming a follower of Christ begins with finding Him. It continues with knowing Him. But as we get to know Him, there's, there's another aspect to following Him. And we want to talk about that today. That has to do with serving Him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go out to eat, I love good service. Now, I love good food as well, but I kind of want the service to be good too. And I've been to some fine dining restaurants. Uh, Just for the record, I'm not real keen on going to those kind of places. I'm not against them. It's just they're not really my cup of tea. I've been to some and I've enjoyed the food and I've really enjoyed the service at those finer dining places. You know what I mean? The servers there, boy, they know what they're doing, right? Boy, I've been to one years ago and sat down at a setting much like this one right here It had more silverware than I knew what to do with. Just like this one. And boy, I thought, man, I'm going to get a bunch of food here. All these forks and spoons and knives and cups and plates and all. If I'm going to go eat, I got an Americanized appetite. You know what I mean? Well, I can remember eating this one fine dining restaurant. And I noticed our server made sure that glass never got below about half filled. Now, I was just, I was drinking my water, and it would get down about halfway, and before I knew it, it it was just filled back up. And it took me a little while to catch on to this, and I tried really, really hard once I knew that dude's on the ball, but I'm going to get him. I am going to get that glass empty before he gets it, he can get it filled back up. And I'm going to tip him well anyway, but I just want to see if I can do it. The challenge was on. And I was trying to be discreet. So I'd eat some, and I'd drink as much as I could, and I'd turn around and talk with somebody. And the next thing I knew, I turned around, and guess what happened to that glass? The thing was filled back up. And I thought, uh-uh, he's not doing that to me. I'm going to get it. So I took a couple more drinks, ate a little bit, and I was about to get it. got it about down down halfway and was going to try to be discreet again and eat a little bit more. And next thing I turned around, it was filled back up. Man, I I thought the thing had some kind of hose hooked to it. And every time I set the thing down, it just hit a switch and it filled back up. Either that or that waiter was twins. (laughs) I kid you not. That guy served me very, very well. And I enjoyed it. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little more prone to my dining experiences being more in a diner than a five-star restaurant. And if you hadn't been to Dolly's lately, you ought to go. Because you get some of the finest service there. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Dolly's is a diner. It's in what? The top 5-10% of diners in the nation. Okay? Won an amazing award and rightfully so. So as I say this, just let me tell you, it's not a fine dining experience. They're not going to put eight forks and three spoons and 20 cups in front of you. But you're going to get served very, very well and the food is amazing. How many of you like being served well? Amen. We enjoy that. We like to know, especially if we're going to a sit-down restaurant, that our order's going to be taken, they're going to get it right, the food's going to be good. And while we may tolerate the glass at least getting down to where there's nothing but ice in it for a few minutes, we don't want to have to, excuse me, could you give me some more to drink, right? We appreciate those who are diligent in making sure that we are taken care of. Amen? We like to be served. A 
Jesus taught a lot about serving. And in Matthew, the 20th chapter, you don't have to turn there. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6 in just a moment. But in Matthew chapter 20, his closest followers had an issue that come up. Matter of fact, if you read in Matthew chapter 20, you'll find out it actually might have been two of the disciples' mama that had an issue with what was going on. You know how you mamas can get when you wonder if your boys or your kids, even your girls, boys or girls, I want something special for my kids. And the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 20 uh, that uh, two of the boys, two of the disciples had their mom come up and approach Jesus and ask a question. It was James and John's mother. And she came up to Jesus and said, Look, when you get this organization really kicked off the ground, I want my boys to be at your right hand and your left. I want them to be in supervisory positions. I want them in offices. I don't want them pushing brooms and Sway, uh, using mops. I want them giving the orders. Amen? Well, Jesus looked at those boys and said, Hey, guys, to get that kind of position in my kingdom, you got to drink of the cup that I drink of. And you got to be willing to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. Well, James and John were like, okay, no big deal. Drinking from a little cup, getting dunked. They didn't understand what Jesus was talking about was being baptized by fire, if you will, by sacrifice, by giving of himself. So they agreed to that. Jesus looked back at them and said, okay, you're going to experience at least some of what I'm going to go through. But to be quite honest with you, to give the positions that your mom's asking me for is not mine to give. The Father's already set that in order. Well, they didn't get exactly what they requested. And as this discourse was going on, the other ten disciples heard what was happening. And you know what? They thought immediately, well, isn't that good of those two guys? Look at their ambition. I wish I had ambition like that. Kudos, James and John. Way to go, guys. We appreciate you. No, that's not what they did. They got ticked. They got to thinking, who do they think they are? Mama's boys. Got your mama to go up there and ask, can you have positions on your right hand and your left hand? <laughs> what do they think they're doing? And actually, I believe, for whatever it's worth, the reason they got angry is none of them thought to go ask for them positions themselves. Jesus realized there was a problem. And here's what he said to all of the disciples in the beginning of verse 24. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. But it's not supposed to be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your what? Servant in the New King James Version, I believe in the King James Version, it says slave. If you want to be great, become the servant. And whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus wanted his closest followers to understand at that moment in time, guys, if you really want to understand what my kingdom is all about, it is not about titles. 
It's not about being the boss. It's not about being the greatest. My kingdom and what I'm establishing is about being a servant and sacrificing for others. He couldn't have made it any plainer, amen? I mean, is there any question in your mind what he's communicating as we read those verses? And don't you think when those 12 guys and two of them's mom heard it, that it would have just clicked like, okay, thank you, check, lesson learned, we got it now. But they didn't get it. Sometime later, Jesus and his disciples are about to have what we know as the Last Supper. And there was this private event where Jesus was there with his closest followers who had already been told in plain language, don't seek to be great, seek to be a servant. Be like me. I, I, I came not to be served but to serve and to give my life a ransom for everyone. Well, they go into this private gathering and there's not a servant there. There's not a, a waiter for a fine dining experience. They have their meal together and, and in that culture and in that time, it was common for a servant to be on hand to wash the guest's feet as they came in. Well, nobody was there to do that task and none of those 12 disciples including James or John, decided to take that role upon themselves. If you read in John chapter 13, the scripture says that Jesus quietly took a basin and some water and a towel and just quietly began going around and washing the disciples' feet. Can you imagine that scene? They're sitting there just having a good time, probably talking again about how great things are going to be when Jesus finally gets elected and gets in office. He'll be our man and everything will be good for us because our guy will be in charge. Well, meanwhile, Jesus is over here washing this one's feet and then that one and then another. Can't you imagine at that point the room got quiet? And he gets to Peter. And Peter says, uh-uh, sorry. But Lord, you're not washing my feet. Well, Jesus and Peter have this little discussion about what it means to be served and served well. And how Peter's got to let him do this or he's not going to be in on any of this. And Peter then goes to the other extreme just like Peter. Over here, over here, you know, just on both ends of the spectrum. And Jesus then washes Peter's feet. And in John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, he says these words. When he finished washing their feet and had taken his garments, he sat down again and he said, Do you realize what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you do so, saying so well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, that's one thing. But blessed or happy are you if you do them. This is now the second distinct time where Jesus is communicating to his followers, guys, my kingdom is not about being bosses, but about being servants. Two clear lessons Jesus gave to the disciples. Did they get it after those two lessons? I kind of think they did. And here's why. Fast forward to Acts the 6th chapter. It's our text for today. And please follow along as we go through about the first seven verses or so. By the time we get to Acts chapter 6, Jesus 
has gone through this time where his, he, he has uh, been taken from the garden. He has been wrongfully tried. He's been crucified. He died on the cross. He gave his life the sacrifice for many as he told them he would. And praise God, he was raised three days later from the grave for our salvation. Glory to God. And the, these disciples, these followers, these friends as he called them, they saw him die. They knew where he was buried. And each of them, minus Judas, had seen him since he'd raised from the dead. Now they had heard his words to go to Jerusalem and to tarry there until the promise of the Father, which he said was the Holy Spirit given, would come upon them. They lived in obedience to that and the Holy Spirit was given. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2. And now as they have been filled with the Spirit of God, they were doing this great ministry and God was honoring their faithfulness and their efforts and their servanthood because people were being won to Jesus. They were making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? And as the church grew, they ran into a problem. Imagine that. And Acts chapter 6 records the particular problem that they ran into. Follow along with me in Acts chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there was a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and in whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And note verse 7 especially. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at what happened now. After two very distinct teachings about how uh, they're to be servants, and after the Holy Spirit filled those believers' lives, I believe they got with the program. I believe they began to understand, you know what? If we're going to be great in the kingdom, we got to figure out ways to serve. And we want to be obedient to what Jesus said, and we want to see His message uh, spread throughout the land. And they were serving in various ways and God was blessing their efforts. And when they came upon this problem in Acts chapter 6, they handled it with servant hearts. There are five things very quickly I want us to see that Acts chapter 6 teaches us about servanthood. The first one is this. Prayer and ministry of the word is service to God. Don't let anybody ever teach you or, or tell you that it's not. We know when we're taking time to get into the Bible for ourselves and we're taking time to talk with God, we're serving Him. Amen? We are, we are investing time in growing our, per, in our personal relationship with Him and that's important for our own well-being first and foremost. But it's also important because as we get closer to Him, as we find Him and we know Him, we can serve Him through the Word and through prayer, and then He can enable us to serve other people for His honor and glory. And this ministry of the Word and prayer, whenever you get the opportunity to do that, that's service to God. I am grateful today for people who down through the years have served the Lord in the local church, especially through teaching Sunday school. Man, I am the beneficiary of so many Sunday school teachers down through the years. A few of you know the name, but let me mention it. There's this little sweet lady. Uh, she was tall to me when I was in her class, but she's really only about this tall. 
Evelyn Dye down in the well in Welch. Boy, she's been teaching children Bible stories for decades. And I'm one of the ones she taught. Oh man, my parents both spent time volunteering and teaching the Word of God in Sunday school, in kids' classes. We, we went to mom's class, and then when we aged out of that, we went to dad's class. And I'm grateful for people like my parents who taught the Word of God. I'm grateful for youth volunteers. We never had a, a full-time youth pastor or even a paid youth pastor. I'm not opposed to those. I think those folks have a calling, and it's important work that they do. And, and to have one for pay, not, I don't have a problem with that at all. But, but growing up in McDowell County, we had youth workers who just volunteered their time, and they poured into me when I was a knucklehead teenager. Anybody remember those days when you were a knucklehead teen? Some of you are wondering, some of those who raised their hands, did they ever get out of that knucklehead part? They're not teens anymore, but they're still, right? Look, these people poured into my life. They prayed for me. They served the Lord. Many times through the local church by ministering the word of God in prayer. I'm grateful today to be a, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only by faith, but by profession, by calling. I'm thankful that I get to do what I do. I'm thankful that I get to do this uh, in this location and serving this congregation at this time. And, and, and I, I look, I've been at this for a while. I have heard all the jokes just about anybody could tell about how preachers only work four hours a week. Yeah. And here's what's so funny about that to me. If I try to get a little bit of overtime in today and go past 11 o'clock, some of you are going to get upset. Listen to me. If you're called either as a lay volunteer or as a, or as a vocational minister to minister the word of God, that is serving the Lord. Amen. Don't you ever forget that. The disciples were very much about doing that. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 6, that they acknowledge, okay, there's something important going on here, and we're not beyond serving in this capacity. But it's good and right for us to keep our focus on prayer and the ministry of the word. So we're going to appoint some people to do this other work or to oversee this other work. That brings us to this next point. Serving food, feeding the needy and hungry people is service to God as well. Aren't you glad to know that? Aren't you glad God's people can eat together? I know we had not done that in a while, but that day's coming. Don't think, don't think that it's never going to happen again. I'm sorry it's taking as long as it's taking, but that day is coming. There are hungry people out there, my friends. And when you make a meal for them, maybe it's they're down and out and they really have no food. Let me tell you something. You're doing God's service by making that casserole. And it's got to be a casserole and not a salad, right? Because we're still in the south, right? It could be a salad too. You give a cup of cold water in the Lord's name and you're not going to lose your reward. Feeding hungry people is service to God as well. Let me tell you, I have been so blessed uh, in just a short time with you guys watching how you bless other people and you come alongside, particularly families who've lost loved ones. Uh, as Alan left this world and stepped into his eternal reward. Carol and the family were grieving and their family who had been such a big part for so many different times for so many others of us here who had lost loved ones, their family was standing in need of just being cared for. And boy, it was amazing for me to watch after that funeral how we were able, even in this pandemic type situation, to serve this family. Look at these folks. Look at them good looking ladies and that one good looking man in that picture. Mashed up, shielded up, serving, gloved up, sanitized up, 
serving food as people walk by, cafeteria style. And let me tell you, the most important thing about this is not all the COVID protocols. It's the servant's heart behind each one standing behind that line and each person who safely and lovingly delivered the food. My friends, there are a thousand ways to serve God. Prayer and ministry of the Word is included in it, but it goes beyond being a teacher or a preacher or a missionary or, or even singers. Those ways are included. But, but hear me today. I found out years ago, I, I'm a trained minister. I was right out of Bible college. I was in my first church, and I had been trained to do so many different things, including funerals. One of the first funerals that I did in Ohio while I ministered there was for a man that I had visited with time after time after time. He had developed cancer. He also had developed AIDS. And because he had AIDS and his immune system was compromised from that, cancer technically killed him. I had made numerous visits to him and to his family. And, and when he left this world, I knew it was my opportunity to not only serve by uh, going and visiting the family while he was alive and him and his family, but ministering to the family after he passed. I preached the funeral. I did everything I knew how to do that I'd been trained to do as a minister of the gospel with a Bible college degree and with a certificate at that time that said I was a licensed minister. I did those areas of service and I went to that widow and I said to her, is there anything else you need? And she said, yeah, um, actually there is. Gene and I, still had our own houses. They, this couple had just recently gotten married within the last year to year and a half. He still had a home. He had moved into her home, but he still owned one. And that house needed to be emptied. And she looked at me and said, can, can you help, can the church help get his stuff out of the house? When I went a minute, I was trained to be a minister of the gospel, right? I was trained to visit. I was trained to preach funerals. I was trained to come in and offer pastoral prayers. And I did all of that. And I want you to know probably the most important thing that I did as far as I'm concerned for that family is go home and put on clothes that I would much rather wear, to be honest, and find a guy in the, truck, in the church who had a truck, because I didn't at that time, and say, hey, have you got some time that we can go over and help take this stuff to the dump? My friends, service to God takes place in a multitude of, of ways. And I believe some of the best service to God happens when we go out of these doors. There are three other things. We need to serve in the area that's going to bring the greatest return. The disciples had discernment in this situation. They saw that there were a lot of hungry people that needed to be fed. They saw a practical ministry that needed to keep going on. But they understood, you know what? If we don't give our primary attention to prayer and the ministry of the word, the church will quit growing. So we're not beyond doing this service. We just need to involve some other people who can do these things as well. So that's the way they operated and that was wisdom um, many of you have had the benefit of listening to the preaching ministry of or maybe read some of the books of uh, Dr. Charles Stanley pastor of the First Baptist Church for many many years down in Atlanta Georgia now while we may not agree on every detail when it comes to doctrine with Dr. Stanley we could agree he is a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
He, by the way, recently announced that he'll be retiring from that position at the ripe young age of 80-something. Okay, He served the Lord faithfully, and uh, may God bless him as he steps into this next phase of his life. But his son, Andy Stanley, told the story of how his dad, Charles Stanley, who is the author of so many books that's blessed so many different people, at Christmas time, Charles Stanley would put on his blue jeans and a t-shirt and he would go down to the shipping department where the books were going out and he would help load boxes because so many books had been ordered for Christmas gifts. He would get in the shipping department and he would help load books so they could be shipped out for the Christmas gifts that people had bought. He did that temporarily. He wasn't beyond doing it, but he did that for a time. But he also knew he couldn't spend all of his time doing that. If he didn't go and spend some time in prayer and reading the Word, he wouldn't be able to write any more books. And the people in the shipping department would be out of a job. So that's an example of Dr. Stanley temporarily doing something in this moment, but then giving his greater effort to what he needed to be doing most. We need to serve in the areas where the, we can, the, the kingdom of God can get the greatest return. The fourth thing that I want us to see from this story is this. The prerequisite for service is holiness. Or another way of saying this is this. Our service to God needs to spring from our relationship with Him. Do you get that? Now if you read in the scripture you'll find out in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, when they were picking out people to oversee the business of waiting tables, you know what they looked for first? Didn't they look for first how well they can use a towel? I mean, that'd be kind of important, arguably. They didn't look for how sharply they were dressed or not dressed sharp or whatever. They didn't look at how well they held the towel or anything like that. No, what they wanted to know first was give us some people full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Give us some people who know God. Give us some people who have a relationship with Him. Give us some people who want His cause to go forward. And let's appoint them over this business. Listen to me. When it comes to serving the Lord, our service to Him, whatever that is, needs to come out of our relationship with Him. You go back and you read in the Sermon on the Mount, there are these words that honestly haunt me at some point. Jesus looks and says these words, Hey, there are going to be people who stand before me on that day and they're going to say to me, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and preach in your name and, and uh, heal people in your name? And I'm going to look back at them and I'm going to say, Depart from me, from me because you never served me well enough. Is that what Jesus said? Get out of here because you just missed the mark uh, on how you, you did this ministry or that ministry. No. At that point, Jesus says, I'm going to look at those and them and say, Depart from me because I didn't know you. I want you to understand. I, I want us to get clearly. Serving God is very important. It is extremely important. But serving Him comes as a result of us knowing Him. And it's an overflow of our relationship with Him. And because we know Him, we serve Him. The last thing from this story that I want us to get is this. Every servant has a responsibility to be a witness. I don't care what your task is. You're a witness for the Lord. You know this about the preachers, right? I mean, do you realize that if I go out to eat this Sunday and I sit down at the restaurant and the server comes up to me and you hurry up and get me something to drink. And yeah, by the way, I want my bread and my butter now. And go ahead and get that steak just the way I like it. And they bring it to me just as I say, why, why is this drink not filled back up? 
Boy, you know, I wouldn't have to do that too many times. Matter of fact, I probably don't have to do it once. It'd be all over social media. Can you believe that preacher down there at First Church of God on the Hood Avenue? He stood up there and he says all that stuff to them people on Sunday. And Lord, how did he act when he went out to eat? Well, you know, the preacher has a witness in how he conducts himself or herself, whatever the case may be. Do you realize it's not just the pastors? It's every one of us. Whatever position we hold, whatever service we give to the Lord, we are His followers. We're His disciples. And we're to be used of the Lord. How we live our lives is going to say something about who we serve. And regardless of the area of service that we are called to, we're still witnesses for the Lord. Specifically, when you read through the Jerusalem 7, if you will, that were picked to do this ministry of overseeing the waiting of tables, you read about a man named Stephen. His primary responsibility as far as position in the church at that point was to oversee the ministry of serving tables. But he happened to get the opportunity to preach the word of God to a bunch of non-believing Jews. And as he proclaimed with boldness the truth of the gospel, they were cut to the heart and they didn't repent. They killed him. Stephen became known as the first Christian martyr. Then there's a guy listed among those seven named Philip. Philip was out in the long one day and happened upon by divine intervention an Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot. And in a one-on-one -on -one situation, that Ethiopian eunuch was reading through the scroll of Isaiah and Philip said, hey, can I help you with something? Now, Philip's responsibility was overseeing waiting tables. He wasn't there to give him a Big Mac, all right? He said, I can explain to you what you're reading. And as he expounded the scriptures to him, that Ethiopian eunuch became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, what was Philip's primary responsibility according to Acts chapter 6? Overseeing the waiting of tables. But his greater responsibility was to minister the word of God. Listen to me today. This is all about being a servant. And if you are seeking in the kingdom of God positions of authority so that you can boss people around, you better get on your knees before God and do some praying. There's nothing wrong with being in charge. Don't get me wrong. Somebody's got to lead. But your heart for anything you do for the Lord had better be to serve. Jesus said of himself, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. He showed by his example with his own disciples, and it's recorded in the Holy Scripture for you and for me to benefit from that he was our master and teacher, and yet he bowed before, he knelt before his disciples, and he washed their feet. Hear me today, my friends. To be a follower of Christ means having a servant's heart just like Jesus's. And if we are going to win this lost and dying world, we're going to have to go from this place and serve out there, showing them that Jesus is the way. Now, I'm keenly aware that many opportunities for service happen in this building and on this campus, and I'm grateful for that. But I'm convinced now more than ever that God's service, our greatest service to God, if you will, begins not when we come in these doors, but when we leave them. And today, my friends, when we leave here, I pray God gives us a fresh vision and direction on how 
we can serve Him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please? Lord, I thank you today that you give us the opportunity to not only find you and know you, but out of the fullness of our relationship with you, we can serve you as well. Lord, I thank you for the countless people you have used along the way in my life, serving me in your name, showing me through that service, Lord, who you really are. Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us who are hearing this today to take to heart what you teach and what you say about being true servants of yours. And Lord, may we leave this service changed people for your honor and glory. And may we enter into a lost and dying world ready to serve them in your name that we might win them for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray and say together, amen and amen.